Um, so this is basically where my research is at at the moment, and it, it goes in several different directions, um, and I hope to take these directions and draw them. So, uh, just a few kind of remarks to, to frame it. I'm looking at um, what, what does immortality mean in the modern period, and from at least the Ramakrishna, Vivekananda literature and afterwards, it's explicitly linked to some kind of Vedantic realization. Um, obviously, there's resonance of this before, um, but uh, Vivekananda was such a um, pervasive influence throughout Indian thinking that this is really a, an important marker. And then I'm also looking at the periodic appearance of sadhus or yogis or fakirs or, or whatever they're called, we don't know who they are. Um, but some kind of religious renunciate, um, offering um, some kind of commentary on the medical discourse, offering possibilities of immortality, offering specific health interventions at various times, and also as objects of science. What, what are those cities? How can we test them? And these all kind of seem to relate to each other in various ways. So first of all, just to, to give you a uh, what, what Vivekananda and Ramakrishna are talking about with immortality. This was um, from a 1907 publication in English, um, so I think it's probably largely Vivekananda influence. Uh, there are infinite ways which lead to the sea of immortality. The main thing is to fall into that sea. It matters not how it gets there. Um, suppose there's a reservoir of nectar with a single drop of which falling into the mouth will make one immortal. You may drink of it by jumping into the reservoir or by slowly walking down its slope. The result will be the same. So the paths are innumerable. You can do it by jhana, karma, or bhakti. Um, they all lead to the same goal, and this is immortality, essentially. Um, and it goes on. And in a different passage, um, in a different publication, this one's a bit later, um, the eternal spirit appears as a manifold of individuals endowed with form and subject to conditions of time. The immortal becomes a victim of birth and death. The changeless undergoes change. The sinless, pure soul, hypnotized by its own maya, experiences the joys of heaven and the pains of hell. But one who knows himself to be one with the universal spirit realizes ineffable peace. Only then does he go beyond the fiction of birth and death, and he becomes immortal. And this is the ultimate goal of all religions, to dehypnotize the soul, now hypnotized by its own ignorance. Um, so the, the use of hypnosis in this is very interesting, which is a theme I'll come back to. Um, and the identification of the soul beyond this specific material body is also part of this um, kind of elision or, or slipping of immortality into many different meanings. And it's really interesting to see how the philologists um, argue about the specific meaning in a specific context. And looking at the modern period, one of my conclusions to this is, is really that the lack of a specific meaning is partially why these terms are so popular and so prevalent um, that you can't, they, they mean different things to different people and that's why they're so powerful. Um, and so, so just a kind of quick um, uh, immortality is important to Ramakrishna and Vivekananda, then Aurobindo uh, takes it on as a big preoccupation um, with his idea of uh, the life divine and the idea of a, the evolution of, of mankind into a superman of some sort, um, a bit different than Nietzsche, but um, in, in, in The Life Divine, which is quite a huge book, um, he mentions immortality over 60 times, and I understand there's been some kind of um, uh, cognitive dissonance around his own death with with some of his devotees. Um, Shivananda, I'll, I'll get into, in, I'll give you some quotes from him in a second. He uses a kind of uh, e eclectic pragmatism in his definition of immortality. Parhamsa Yogananda with uh, Kriya Yoga is also very influential. And you've got various traces of immortality coming in with various um, contemporary yogis, including Ramdev. Um, there's also a, 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 a Siddhamrit Surya Kriya Yoga, which is very interesting in promising immortality. Um, so, going back to Ramakrishna, the person who allegedly um, gave Ramakrishna, according to the hagiographical stories, his initiation to formless um, samadhi was a sadhu called Toti Puri. Um, and he 
1864 had arrived at um, a temple in uh, Varanasi. He was um, a Dasnami order, um, and he um, and so he was supposed to have initiated on Krishna into this understanding of the dance that he eventually transmitted to Vivekananda. And then according to the legend, and it's a bit difficult to say when this got attributed, he was supposed to be um, 200 to 300 years old. Um, however, it's very likely that this got split into two people, and you get some people who have the Totapuri who died in 1866, but then you also have the same person allegedly reappearing in the 1920s um, in Odesha, and there's now an ashram there that equates him with the one who gave Vivekananda this realization. However, there's also a, a testimony that he, he mostly just sat under a tree and never replied about his age, the one who founded the, the ashram. So it was a case of letting people um, tell stories about him, I think, um, conflating the two and not, um, not saying this is not the case. That's my, my um, theory. So this is um, the Totapuri picture of the guy who was um, in Odesha. Uh, well, I think we can definitely say that someone who looked old from 1920 to 1961 lived in this location with the same name as Ramakrishna's um, sadhu. And then uh, perhaps one of the most uh, uh, widespread, widely known contemporary multi centarians allegedly is um, Devraha Baba, who became very well publicized in the 80s and 90s. And it seems that most of the testimony as to how many hundreds of years he lived, it came from people saying, my father's father went to him as a child and he looked the same. Um, so it's, it, the skeptic in me wonders if there were perhaps a few sadhus who looked quite similar. Um, he, he allegedly achieved this long life through Udhyana Banda and some other yogic bandhas, but um, I think that was fairly um, kind of conjecture of people who are making those claims. So what's the point of claiming these people lived for, for many hundreds of years in the modern period? I think that most importantly these stories open up possibilities and miracles about the world being slightly different than our mundane assumptions. And <coughs> the stories themselves, the possibility of immortality reassesses um, our idea of reality open up, opens up new ways of thinking about identity, somatic experience, and what, what is truth. So just having the idea that this might be possible changes your understanding of the world. Okay, so then moving on to um, the second section of Sadhu's offering medicine or healing in various ways. Um, so there's it's also worth noting that several of these people who offer medical interventions as aesthetics also claim extraordinary longevity. There's various um, places where yogis or figures act as medical advisors to people in the Mongol Empire, um, and I'm kind of trying to collect these together, so if anyone wants to tell me any others, I'm grateful of any others. Um, and I think that sometimes sadhus, um, when they start collecting followers in one particular place, um, lots of people come up to them with their problems. These problems are framed in all sorts of ways. They're material, they're emotional, they're also physical. And um, they, they may give herbal advice, but they may also just offer healing in various ways. Um, and, and so um, uh, that, that's one avenue. There's also sadhus who have established um, the, this particular interesting example was the guru of Kuvalyanda and Yogananda. Um, by the, and he, um, he had a claim of being 123 years old when he died in 1921. Of course, that, his birthday is probably unverifiable. Um, but it seems that he had an ashram where there's a kind of sick ward where they did yogic um, kriyas as therapy. And there's not very much information about this, but it'd be great to know if this was also, uh, this kind of ashram set up with a healing ward was set up in any, anywhere else in India in the 19th century. Um, and, yeah, that's the only example I know about at present. And I also think that this 123 years um, is a significantly long 
life in the context of Indian life expectancy. And I, I was recently reading the reports of the Indian government um, in the early 1950s about life expectancy. And it, it was a real concern getting people to live kind of, you know, once, once you're five it was easier, but past 40 was still a bit of a stretch for contemporary India. So now we've got uh, Swami Shivananda, um, who's of course was very influential globally about how we understand yoga. His pamphlets circulated everywhere. Um, he has no claims for extreme life extension or physical immortality, but he's got this Vedantic equation of immortality and divine life. Um, so he says here, diseases are the destroyers of health, health is the means for attaining moksha, um, qualify yourself as your own doctor. Um, if you nurse the sick, if you do your karma yoga, if you purify your minds, then you'll attain immortality, um, which is, is quite in, in line with um, Seva and um, Kudikananda's ideas as well. Um, and then what he says over here is very interesting as well. The best medicine or tonic for any complaint is thinking, I am the spirit, I am Atman, I am independent of body and mind. Um, this will give you inner strength and elevation. A habit of thinking in this direction is um, a solace, a comfort, a mental peace. It, essentially, this is a panacea for all pain. And you get this more, you, you also get this theme throughout the 20th century, especially also the 19th century of, um, of uh, a recognition, a, a kind of a city of your spiritual attainment is in, in being impervious to pain. Um, and that might be another sense of immortality. If you're not identified with your mortal body, it doesn't matter what happens to it. Um, Shivananda is also interesting in his uh, medical advice, because of course he was a practicing biomedical doctor before he took his renunciation vows. But he's got a 1942 publication called Family Doctor, um, which this picture in the poetry is the front piece for. But it's quite interesting the way it's divided up in that it's got chapters on biomedical anatomy, hydrotherapy, the science of diet, biomedical first aid, um, the treatment of poisoning, and then he lists various diseases with allopathic, Ayurvedic, homopathic, and Unani treatments for each of the diseases. So it's really just a hodgepodge of, of anything that might work. <laughs> So then the, the final example, I spoke about this um, in the spring of a sadhu offering medical treatment, is, is this very interesting case of the Udasi um, Swami Tapsi Baba. And he got quite a lot of media attention in 1938 by offering a, a kuti kaya treatment of uh, Pandit uh, Mohan Malvidya, who founded BHU. Um, the secret herbal ingredients, of course we don't know exactly what they were, but they kind of resonates with various things that we've talked about already. Um, involved tamala, uh, milk from a specific kind of black cow, some herbs that were grown, and, um, and having this um, putty treatment with the making pills. Um, I'm happy to discuss, uh, I can say a lot more about him. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few more pictures. These are before and after pictures of Malvidya after he did the Kuti treatment. Um, he obviously looked more vigorous, but he didn't live forever. And um, the 1938 was quite a bad timing for this, in that it, everyone got quite pre preoccupied with the Second World War and then um, Indian independence, so he kind of got forgotten about for a bit. And I just really love the, the really convincing woodcuts. I love woodcuts, uh, but before and after and woodcuts. Um, so when Topsy Baba died, um, there's two, two biographical, well, two different accounts of his life, which are very interesting to compare. To compare. And in, when he died um, in 1955, so the Sadi who did the treatment, um, there was a, he had some kind of growth on his thigh, and he needed an operation for it. And uh, the devotee made a big deal of how he didn't need any, any anesthetic for the operation. And then the, the result of the operation was that it went septic and he died as a result of the operation. But he didn't experience any pain in this whole time. So he must have been really enlightened and really 300 years old. Um, and this also resonates with the uh, hierarchical accounts around the Romana Marishi, who, attended his, who <coughs> attained his enlightenment according to the stories through a confrontation of his fear of death when he was a teenager. And 
then he was imperious of body, bodily pain for the rest of his life. And many of his devotees also experienced his divine intervention in taking away their own physical pain, um, even though I think uh, Ramana Maharishi himself never discussed this or claimed this, but the, the accounts of devotees report this. Okay, so the third theme is the studies as objects of biomedical science, and I'm, I was very excited to learn how much more my colleague Carl Bayer knows about this than I do. Um, but I think this feeds back into the narratives of the later 19th and early 20th centuries, it feeds forward into them about how we're thinking about cities, what immortality means, what longevity means. So there is this really well publicized case in 1837 um, of Haridas being buried alive for 40 days with Kachari Mudra. Um, this took place in, in the court of um, uh, Maharaja of, of, in Lahore. And um, it seems to have been taken largely at face value. There are quite good European witnesses who wrote about it in a convincing way and entered the medical discourse. Um, and what was, um, what was quite current um, in this time was, in the early 19th century, was a discussion about um, hibernation and prolonging life through um, reducing your amount of, of breaths. So I kind of wonder um, to what extent that fed forward into the Kuvalyana um, ashram experiments in the 1920s. But this is another early discourse on yoga philosophy um, by a, a member of the armed services in India, who was an Indian. Um, and what I find quite interesting is abstinence diminishes the number of respirations, which diminishes the waste of the body, and this promotes longevity. Um, if, if you breathe less, you live longer. Um, and this is compared with other animals, and you, you've got kind of these like, can you measure how much water comes out of you when you breathe? Um, if you can hibernate, animals that hibernate live longer, and if humans can hibernate, then they'll live longer. Under hypnotism, um, James Gray is coming up with um, using the sadhus and their ability to mesmerize themselves as changing the language of, of this whole discourse about mesmerism to something that maybe is more scientific, something you can do to yourself. Um, so so self-trance, um, human hibernation, self-hypnosis, and this being a particularly promising um, element of pain relief before we had chloroform and, and these kinds of more universally um, effective pain remedies. And you, oh, that's the other way. And you continue to get, there's James Braid, um, you continue to get these these very scientific explorations of, of potential cities um, with the language of magnetism and hypnotism throughout the 19th century in really kind of what's trying to be a very scientific exploration of what's possible in terms of human life extension. Okay, so then my final section is the contrast between two different treatments in the, in the contemporary period. So I spoke with um, Ram Pandey, who is offering kaiapalpa treatments in California. He grew up in northern India from a, a Siddha family. Um, he spent several years wandering around India, where he learned his healing skills. Um, and the way he frames it, kaiapalpa is, is about the Siddhas, the Tantras, and spiritual realization. What he actually offers is quite a lot to do with Panchakarma and quite standard Ayurvedic treatments, but he definitely sees Kalakalpa as expanding the mind, offering some kind of um, insight, some kind of spiritual insight. And the people who come to see him, he hopes that they are both healed for the physical complaints as well as achieving some kind of spiritual insight. And in contrast, we've got, um, and this is more of Pande. Um, so I, I think it's quite interesting, he says on um, one of his publicity, um, to educate, heal, and enlighten today's humanity using ancient yet postmodern tools. Um, which I find very self-reflective self in a way. And then uh, an Ashtabadian um, who's been friends with Dagmar for quite a long time spoke to me about his experiments with offering Kuti treatments um, in, in the last few years. And he tends to offer these um, 
to, it seems to be particularly Westerners who have been interested and have the time and money to have the hut constructed for their own purposes. And he's very interested in the biomedical results, the, the blood tests that come out from before and after, and um, finds them very effective. Uh, quite a lot of his clientele are devotees of um, Transcendental Meditation and the Maharishi. Uh, however, the way he was talking about it for me, he only framed this in that this is useful because they're able to sit in the hut by themselves for a long time. He wasn't particularly interested in their use of spiritual attainments or, um, or, or how this might relate to their spiritual path at all. He was interested in blood results and um, the, the healing, the, the biomedically measurable healing effects of these traditional remedies. Um, it, it was also interesting in that he offered, he talked about offering traditional um, uh, astrological charts and puja interventions to deal with karmic diseases, but again, it's just because some people find this effective, it's just matters of, about efficacy rather than the, the framework. So here we've got kind of the same, a lot, also a lot of what he offers was kind of a, along the lines of panchikarma um, therapies. As well as, as herbal preparations, and, and Pandey also offers a special kaya kalpa pill, which he has manufactured in India according to a secret recipe. Um, but on the face of it, a lot of the therapies are quite similar between these two people. However, their ideas of the goals are quite different, and the expectations of those coming to them um, could be quite different. You could you could get. Uh, someone with very spiritual expectations having a very spiritual experience um, in this Ashtavadian framework, or you could get someone going to the more spiritual practitioner having a very biomedical experience and just receiving, um, re relieving their suffering in a, a quite material way or not. Um, so my conclusions at this point, if I, if I can have any, are that there's definitely a, a sliding use of language between liberation and prolonging life indefinitely in the material world, and these kind of feed into each other. Um, it, there's also a, a tension between um, healing the body and um, illness and pain being a distraction from your practice, and also um, the idea of being insensate to the body's pain as being <coughs> Uh, a result of the practice. And there seems to be quite multiple interactions between religious aesthetics, healing, medicine, um, and there's all sorts of ways that this is happening. Um, and I really liked this um, quote from Kirin Narayan's um, ethnography of, of a sadhu Swami who, who got settled and was primarily a storyteller. But one of his quotes was, you should never assign a meaning to a myth, because if you assign a meaning, the mind clamps onto just that one meaning, and then it's no longer active, because when a story is active, it allows for new beginnings all the time. Don't give meanings to anything, it doesn't ever mean just one thing. Um, so I would say that the immortality story is a compelling one, and it resonates across different concerns at every retelling, and people are, are taking out different things each time they hear it, um, and this ambiguity of goals is part of the narrative strength. And it's also strong because of the experimental truths um, can feel more important and more transformative than any literal um, material empirical confirmation of immortality. <laughs>